Welcome to the Expositors of Second Baptist Church of Houston, North Campus. The class hosts the teaching ministry of James Brooks. Our mission is to grow in the knowledge of Christ through the expositional teaching of God's Word. We do this by studying the Bible line upon line and verse by verse. We teach sound doctrine as we look at and live out God's unfolding plan of redemption for His church. Now let's join James in this week's study of God's Holy Word. Our study of a very uh, difficult chapter, if you will, because of the great mystery that's involved. There's a lot of uh, mystery surrounding this. Interpreters and expositors and scholars uh, do not uh, universally ag agree on what we're going to be uh, discussing this morning, so we need to come to the passage with our hearts open, our minds engaged, and prayerfully as we ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us through this word. But it is a great mystery. What we're looking at fundamentally is order in the church, specifically within the context of subjection to authority in the church. What Paul is dealing with here in chapter 11 is how should men and women function together in corporate worship? He's going to be using some cultural things that is indicative of what's going on at the church in Corinth, but in the backdrop of that, or the foundation for his argument is, how do men and women function together corporately in worship? This is basically Paul's argument. <clears throat> Wearing coverings, hats, veils, what have you, appears to have been a customary symbol in Corinth uh, as a symbol of submissiveness or a symbol of subordination, as in much of the ancient Greek world. As such, coverings and veils are instruments and the means of uh, Paul's argumentation as he uses it to establish order and delegated authority in the church. Men are not to wear a covering, a veil, a cap, or what have you. Uh, while in church. However, women are not to have their head shaved or be unveiled in the church. Both are a disruption of church order and propagate confusion. This was the cultural dilemma that we have here in Corinth. Now, let me say before we be get going, because it might be uh, in the forefront of your mind, uh, you know, if, if what Paul says is accurate and women need to be veiled uh, and not to be veiled as a sin, then we have a lot of women in here who was in the act of uh, committing a sin. So what is the deal with the veil? Uh, is it something that's uh, customary and cultural? Or is it a timeless principle that is a timeless command to be applied? Well, obviously, because we have people who are not really veiled here, uh, the church uh, through history, and by church I don't mean Second Baptist Church, I mean the larger church, <laughs> corporate church, the earthly church, the physical church, uh, has taken the position that this was uh, something that Paul was dealing with uh, as a cultural issue in Corinth. That the problem that he was having in Corinth was that you were have people who were disrupting the order and the authority of church worship. As we said last week, Corinth was a very carnal church. We had people in the church who were arguing over who the best teachers were. We had people in the church who were taking each other to court, suing each other. We had people who were taking the Lord's Supper in an irreverent manner. So there was a lot of carnality occurring in the church. And one of the things that and how that reflected itself was disorder in worship. And so Paul is having to correct that. Now, one scholar <clears throat> made this point in reference to wearing veils. And it's a good general principle. Uh, he said that uh, if you want to find, as you're reading something that's in the text, if you want to find something that is universal, uh, then what a, a good rule of thumb is, do you see it in the Gospels? In other words, was it commanded by Christ? Do you see it being implemented in the early church through the book of Acts? And then finally, is it addressed in an epistle? If all three of those things are true, that is, it's addressed in the Gospels, it's reinforced or demonstrated in the book of Acts, and it's, there's some type of instruction upon it in one of the epistles, then for the most part, that's going to be a, a universal principle that we're going to have to apply. 
If it's something that we find only in one book that we don't find in the other, that is either in the Gospels or in the book of Acts, or if it's found only in the epistles but not in the book of Acts or uh, in the Gospels, then those are the things that ought to make us uh, raise questions in our minds. Is this something that's cultural? Is it something that's indicative of a particular church that Paul is writing to? Or is it something that he's addressing throughout the universal church? What Paul is addressing here in Corinth is the issue of wearing head coverings. However, back behind that where the timeless principle is subordination and subjection to authority in the church. That's the universal principle. Though he's dealing with it within the context of a cultural custom, namely wearing head coverings. So let's look and see how Paul deals with issues. Verses 7 through 10 of this chapter, Paul is going to discuss the custom. And he's going to have the custom defined. In verses 11 and 12, 11 and 12 uh, is the custom defended. And then in verses 13 through 16, the custom deliberated. Not so much by Paul, but by the congregation. Paul is going to ask them, you consider, you consider. So let's uh, consider here by looking at verse 7. The point here is that men are not to have their head, heads covered while in church. Paul says, for a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. So what he's doing is he's making an appeal to creation that man was set up as God's delegated authority upon the earth and that woman was created as a corresponding helper to the man as man is the glory of, or as God is the glory of man. So woman uh, is uh, the glory of man. Consider, for example, uh, the establishment for this principle. Over in Genesis chapter 2, this is where God created man and woman. And specifically here he's talking about how he created the woman. In verse 18 of chapter 2 of Genesis, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. That does not mean that man was lonely. Uh, think about it this way. In this particular state, at this particular time, there was man was not fallen. So his fulfillment came from his relationship with God. In an unfallen state, he was able to fully enjoy the expression of God's fellowship and receiving God's fellowship. So a lot of times when people think of that, they think, well, man was doing his uh, business in the garden, uh, realized that there were two of each kind of animals that uh, they were being brought to him. And then he realized, oh, I'm really lonely. And God took pity upon him and uh, created the woman for him. That, that is not uh, the biblical view. The word there means solely alone. In English, the Hebrew uh, means to be solely or by himself. And so God said it is not good for man to be by himself. Why? Because he can't ca carry out the mandate to rule over the creation by himself. It says, I will make a helper suitable that is corresponding to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept and he took one of his ribs. Literally in the Hebrew, he took a hunk of his flesh and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. So this is a biblical uh, principle that we see here in the book of Genesis that is established in reference to the relationship between men and women. MacArthur notes, God gave man dominion over all the created world to care for according to his divine plan. Man was given rulership over the world. Both men and women are created in God's image. But as Paul points out, the original creation from the dust of the ground was Adam only. Eve was created later from the part of Adam himself. <clears throat> 
The male was given dominion and authority over God's created world and is by that fact the glory of God. Consider verse 8, Paul's argument. He says, for man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but the woman for the man's sake. In what way? In order to establish man's rule. By man, I'm talking about mankind. Man can't do that by himself. Uh, Bailey says this, and by Bailey, I'm talking about Dr. Mark Bailey, who's the uh, uh, excellent expositor in his own right. Uh, he's the president of Dallas Seminary. He writes this in his commentary on this passage. In reference to this head covering, and that's the context of what Paul is talking about. He says women should wear a head covering. Men should not wear a head covering. And he's making his appeal on the created order. He says the head covering then symbolized both the woman's subordinate position under the man and the authority that she had to pray and prophesy in public. The Corinthian women also needed to wear a head covering because angels, the guardians of God's created order, uh, view what is taking place among God's people. For other people to see a Christian woman without a shawl-like covering on their heads was bad enough because it was a sign of insubordination given that cultural uh, climate given that cultural situation. So man was created to be God's delegated authority with woman being made to complement or to correspond and co-rule with man. Yes, sir. James, was it a lot of it because of the, the women's newfound freedom in Christ that a lot of them were rebelling against the having to wear the veils? Uh, the, question, yeah, the question is, was it because of the women's newfound freedom in Christ uh, that they wanted to take off their veils? Uh, because Paul would go on to say over, over in Galatians that there is neither male nor female uh, and so forth. Uh, but he is not establishing an, an egalitarian situation. That is, uh, both are equal. Though there were some, uh, scholars have speculated, this was uh, one of the feminist movements arising within the church. Uh, however, it was based more upon insubordination rather than them misunderstanding what being co-equal truly means. Yeah, but and the other thing I wanted to ask James when I studied this was, this was for the church and because of the new dispensation. But the Jewish people, the Jewish men always wore a little cap. But their distinct, their, the distinction is that they were God's chosen people. Mm -hmm. So would this also apply to the Jewish nation even though... Well, the, yes, this was going to be new for the Jews as well because you're right, they did wear some type of covering. Even today, if you were to attend a Jewish uh, service, they would wear the uh, tallit, the prayer shawl, if you will, uh, as well as uh, somewhere the, uh, the yarmulke uh, on top of their head. So Paul is giving them revolutionary information, if you will, uh, both for the Jew and the Gentile. So not only is he addressing just the women, but he's also addressing the men. But many times we uh, want to focus only on the women. Uh, and, and in this particular case, it might be rightly so because of the, the area of where they were. Uh, remember that in Corinth, you had the city, which was below this uh, high uh, mountain, if you will, uh, called the Acro Corinth, in which the uh, temple of uh, Aphrodite was, and there were over a thousand priestesses who were prostitutes who would come down into the town and ply their trade every night. Uh, and so Paul did not want the women there to be involved or even, even be to be mistaken for having any type of association with that type of paganism. Yes, sir. In reference to Paul, the question is, would any of these principles apply today in reference to uh, head coverings and so forth? Uh, there is a cultural tradition that we see enacted, and it's based upon this. Um, I can tell you that I think, and I'm actually answering something that I answer at the end, but I think this is more customary for that specific church because... This covering, the head coverings, the, the modesty. Now, I think the modesty in one's dress is the timeless principle. However, I think how that's reflected specifically in a head covering for men, 
uh, or not having a head covering for men and the veils for women was something that's indicative of a local uh, custom there in Corinth. But again, scholars debate this. You know, in the final analysis, uh, some of the, the most enlightened scholars basically said, you know, we can read the words on the page, but its implications and how it's worked out in the church, the best answer we can give you is we just really don't know. So. Uh, consider what Paul says in here in verse 10. He says, therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. So he's establishing order and delegated authority in the church. And his appeal doesn't seem to have anything to do with uh, the relationships between men and women, husbands, wives and so forth. But his appeal is on these angels. And he says, ladies. You ought to have a symbol of authority on your head because of the angels. Now, what is significant about the angels and why does Paul use that to formulate an argument? Well, one view, and this was one of the views of the early church. Uh, John Gill, who was the great Baptist uh, theologian from England, said, quote, The church father Tertullian understood these angels to be evil angels and that a woman should cover their head in time of worship, lest they should lust after her, that is, these evil angels, though much rather the reason should be lest they should irritate and provoke lust in others. This was a very common view. Some theologians even hold that today, and what they make their appeal to is over in Genesis chapter 6, when the sons of God looked upon the daughters of men, and then demon-possessed these men in order that they may have relations with these women uh, producing evil children, if you will. And so the argument goes is that because of what happened in Genesis, apparently the tie into this is that these women back in Genesis chapter six were operating outside of delegated authority. And as such, they fell victim to these angelic beings who then had their way with them. Likewise, the argument goes, <clears throat> women in church need to have some type of symbol of authority on them so that the same thing may not happen again. Now, that's just one particular view. I don't think that that is the correct view. I think that one of the things that we do by way of using sound hermeneutics or biblical interpretation is to see how the author, and in this case it's Paul, how does Paul use angels, not only here, but in other epistles that he writes? And I think that when we do that, we can come up with at least a good answer. For example, uh, Paul tells us that angels long to see God's plan enacted through the church. He tells us that, uh, or, Paul, or Peter tells us that, for example, over in 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, he says, it was revealed to them that is the prophets of old, that they were not serving themselves, but you. And in the context here, he's talking about predominantly Jewish Christians. In these things, which now have been announced to you through, whose, uh, through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So angels are fascinated by the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're infatuated with the outworking of God's progressive revelation and how the church is being built. So one of the reasons why women need to have a symbol of authority on their head is because angels are watching to see how either order is created out of disorder in a fallen world or that corruption is being done in the church by insubordinate uh, people. So they're learning one of those two things. Moreover, angels learn about God's wisdom through the activity of the church. Uh, Paul says over in Ephesians chapter 3, to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light the 
what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So that the manifold wisdom of God, watch this, might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. You see, in the Old Testament, there was no concept of the church in the sense of how there would be one day Jew and Gentile in one body. And that the gospel would be spread through the earth. That was totally foreign in ancient Israel. And so it was a mystery. Something that was not revealed or known then, but revealed in these latter times. And what Paul is saying is that the angels in heaven are learning about God's eternal purposes through the church. And they are learning about how great and how wise God is to fulfill this plan in this way. And then finally, angels see order in the church that is reflective of God's original intent and design for man. When God created this world and placed man as the prime minister of his creation, by man I'm talking about mankind, uh, we have God who created Adam, and then he created Eve to be uh, a, a co-ruler with Adam, um, and then sin entered into the picture. Sin entered into the picture because Adam relinquished his delegated authority. Uh, if you go back and remember, just we won't look at it for the sake of time, but over in Genesis chapter 3, when Satan comes to the woman to tempt her, it's not as if Adam was out somewhere else in the garden doing something. When Satan comes to the woman to tempt her, Adam, the text says, was standing right there. <coughs> What should have happened is that Adam should have said, that's not what God said. Get out of here, devil. And just like the son of God do, uh, would do later in his temptation, the devil would have fl uh, flee from, from Adam. But that's not what happened. And so Adam remained silent. The woman was deceived, fell into a state of sin, and then caused Adam to fall as well. Some have speculated, and I'm in agreement on this, that Adam fell not so much because he really wanted to, uh, you know, have in his heart to, to rebel, although he was doing that, but that he saw the woman and did not want her to be solely and alone, and that for the sake of the woman, he sinned as well. Now, that's pure speculation. But having been married for a long time to see the relationship between men and women, I can see how that thing would, would, could happen like that. Yes, sir. But in Timothy, I think it's Timothy where it talks about Eve was truly deceived, but Adam yeah. was not deceived. That's mm -hmm. why he took the fall. That's true. Uh, he's talking about the passage over in Timothy where it says the woman was beguiled or deceived, yet what Adam did, he intentionally did. That's absolutely right. Because the command to eat or not eat from the tree of life, of knowledge of good and evil, was given solely to the man. When Eve gives her response to Satan over in Genesis chapter 3, she gives wrong information. She says that we shouldn't even touch the tree. That's not what God said. God said the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. Not touch it. So it's quite likely that Adam said, in order to put a hedge around the law, said, you know, I can keep you from eating the, the, the tree because... Just don't touch it. So she misquoted or mishandled the word of God. Whatever she did, she was deceived into doing. What Adam did, he del did deliberately. Thus, he's held accountable for that sin. For the whole of mankind. Uh, consider what uh, Paul says over in 1 Timothy. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles. And he's... He had just given a long list of, of things that are to be done in the church. These things involve love, uh, they involve order in the church, and they involve church discipline. And so Paul is saying is, maintain these principles that I have been given to you. Do nothing in a spirit of partiality. Why? Because of the angels in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his angels. Spurgeon writes, 
The reason why our sisters appear in the house of God with their heads covered is because of the angels. The apostle says that a woman is to have a covering upon her head because of the angels, since the angels are present in the assembly and they mark every act of indecorum. And therefore, everything is to be conducted with decency and order in the presence of angelic spirits. Because God has created and established the church to be a place of order. Therefore, those who are a part of the church need to be orderly in their corporate worship. That is something that's totally contrary to the way this world thinks. But at least in the house of God, there needs to be order. There needs to be authority. There needs to be delegated authority. And there needs to be subjection to that authority. That is the way that God has designed it. So that is the custom defined. Now let's look at the custom defended. Paul will tell us that there is an equality in value of the Christian men and women. Both depend upon each other. He says, however, in the Lord, verse 11, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman and all things originate from God. So there is a sense here and when he when he says, look, men and women are not independent from each other. Men, every one of you in here are here because of a woman. OK, if you're not here because of a woman, see me after class. Okay, <laughs> But we are all here because of women. MacArthur notes men and women have different roles in the church. That is the distinction. However, they are not different by way of importance. Women are equal to men in the world, in the church, and before God. That is God's wise and gracious harmony and balance. Difference in roles, but equality in nature, personhood, work, and spirit. He created both for His glorious purposes. This is something that only Christian theism advances. If you go and look at the other religions of the world, men and women are not on equal footing. One needs only to look at the Quran and see how Islam, for example, views the role of women. There are atrocious things on, on the internet that, that people are doing over there in the name of Islam to women. They beat them, behead them, rape them, stone them. Christ and Christian theism is the only religion that elevates a woman's status back to the way God had it. One commentator said, quote, Christian women make a vital contribution to the kingdom of Christ on the earth. Whether they are continuing steadfastly in prayer, doing good works and acts of charity, showing hospitality, teaching the word in harmony with divine authority, being good wives, rearing godly children or accomplishing various other commendable tasks. Let us rise up and call them blessed. And amen to that. Now consider the last point here. Because Paul is going to relinquish his apostolic rights and then give the audience the right to vote, to consider the evidence. You make the call. You make the decision. Paul makes a summation and then asks for a verdict from the Corinthian audience. He says, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that a man has, if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Now remember, he's talking about a cultural custom within Corinth. Okay, I don't see any guys in here with long hair, but if you happen to walk in the room, I don't want you to turn around and walk right back out, okay? Now remember, he's talking about something that's a cultural custom. <clears throat> MacArthur notes, men and women have diff distinct physiologies in many ways. One of them is in the process of hair growth on the head. Pay attention. Hair develops in three stages. Formation, growth, and resting, and then fallout. And I can see that some of you know that by experience. <laughs> 
The male hormone testosterone speeds up the cycle so that men reach the third stage earlier than women. The female hormone estrogen causes the cycle to remain in a stage for a longer time, causing a woman's hair to grow longer than men's. Women are rarely bald because even uh, because few even reach stage three. This physiolo physiology is reflected in most cultures of the world and the custom of women wearing longer hair than men. So, consider Paul's arguments. Just to review the list. Even back from last week. Paul says, Women are to wear head coverings in church because wives are, be, are to be submissive because the relationship of the Godhead. Remember last week that Paul discussed how uh, the husband and wife's uh, subordination roles in a marriage. Uh, and he based that argument on the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. And that the Son willingly subjected himself to the will of the Father. Yet in their personhood they are co-equal, co-eternal. Uh, and they're absolutely, there is sameness in their, their essence. Different in their roles. Paul discusses that in verse 3. Then in verse 7, he appeals specifically to God's design for man and God's design for woman. And then in verse 8, he appeals to the order of crea creation, that man was created first and that the woman was created second and that the woman was created for man. And then in verse 9, he talks about the role of the woman. And then in verse 10, the interest of the angelic realm. And then finally here, the characteristics of the nature and the natural order. In verse 16, Paul says, there is no evidence that supports any other view without usurping God's purpose and plan for the family and the church in reference to the wearing of the veils. For men, they are not to wear caps or veils. For women, they are to be veiled while in church. Paul says in verse 16, but if one is inclined to be contentious, that is, you hear the argument, but you don't like what you're hearing, he says, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. So that if a person disagrees with this, they are disagreeing specifically with God. MacArthur says, <clears throat> This argument is utterly convincing. If you want to find a sympathetic ear to your dissent, he says, you won't find it among the apostles or in the churches. The apostles and the other churches were firmly committed to the practice that women should wear longer hair than men and should have distinctively female hairdos. And where custom dictated it, they should wear proper head coverings to distinguish themselves as submissive. And that's the number one point that he's trying to argue. That there should be submissiveness in church. So what are some of the things that we can take away with? There is at least two. Wearing veils in this particular instance. And the reason we know that is because when we go back and look at the Gospels, there's not any issue about women and head coverings and so forth. When we get to the book of Acts, there's no instruction in reference to uh, wearing caps or veils and so forth. When we get to the other epistles... What we do find is uh, submission to delegated authority, but not as it is manifested through the wearing of the veils or the head coverings. So that has led many uh, scholars and commentators to conclude that this was a custom indicative of spe specifically uh, this church. There's a lot of things, though, that this church deals with that we don't find in any other epistles. Just wait till we get to chapter 14. It's going to be a hot one there. So the question we have to ask ourselves, aside from the wearing of the caps, the, hell, the, the veil coverings and, and the long hair and so forth, are we submissive where God calls us to be? That's what we need to be concerned with. Are we submissive where God calls us to be? And secondly, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, then this message so much isn't for you. You are one who would be on the outside of the discussion. 
Perhaps you're here this morning and the Spirit of God has pricked your conscience, opened your heart, has spoken to your soul to make you realize that you know that there's something in your life that's missing. That you have to have and, and have a need for fulfillment. Beloved, that gap, that void, that longing can only be filled by a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. God is calling you to be submissive this morning. But he's calling you to be submissive to the message of the gospel. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That means to change your thinking. Change your thinking about who he is. To make him Lord of your life. To submit your need to the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. To ask him to come into your life. And I pray that you would do that right now. All your sins would be washed whiter than snow. And you can walk out those doors a brand new person in Christ. Now included within the true church of God. Well, when we come back next week, we're going to be looking at the Lord's table. The seriousness of the Lord's table. Some people take that flippantly. Some people take that who, is not, who are not authorized to take that. Even in the contemporary church, you realize that Jonathan Edwards, one of the greatest theologians that America has ever produced, as a matter of fact, one encyclopedia calls him the greatest theologian that America has ever produced, was fired from his church over the issue of pedo communion. Children partaking of the elements of the Lord's table. So what's all the big deal about that? When we come back next week, we'll see. that when we come to take the Lord's table, the ordinance of the church, there needs to be also submissiveness of one's heart in partaking of the elements. So I hope you'll come back as we look at that. And again, when we finish up with chapter 11, we will begin with chapter 12. And we'll jump in on spiritual gifts. What are they? Where do they come from? How are they to be utilized in the church? And then specifically, we'll narrow down on the gift of tongues. And in Corinth, the use and abuse of tongues in the Corinthian church. So that's where we're headed. Let's pray.